Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Quiet, numbskulls, I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it, stick it out of it, sells, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. On the show with us today, Bruce Robison, who is the founder of The Next Waltz, which is a record label, a recording studio, a musical community, a management company, and I love this part, a mindset, one shared by those who appreciate artistic integrity and value ambitious and authentic music. Bruce, welcome to the show. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. What you have accomplished, I think, is really cool. Now, first of all, when I was reading the bio on the project that you've done that we're going to talk about today, as a preface, I'm an analog guy in a digital world myself. Oh, is that right? Yeah. So to see that your studio is an all analog studio in Lockhart, Texas, I thought that was so very cool uh, that you put this project together. So with that being said, let's talk about this album that your label has put out there. It's probably more than just a tribute to Willie Nelson. Yeah, I'd, I'd go along with that. It was, a, it was kind of a magical night that just came together in a million different ways that we were really glad that we documented it. And then it sounded so cool that we thought other people ought to hear it. And then everybody just went along with it. So it's been charmed all the way. It's kind of a long story, but every step along the way are things where you, you dream up what you'd like to happen. You think there's no way that's going to happen, and then it just does all the way. And then the, the people that were there. But in general, it was coming out of the pandemic. It was very early on when we could get together. And so the gist of the show was just having this excuse to get together and, and, and play this amazingly, you know, inspiring music with our friends that we had been, you know, away from for years. And, and it was just a really wonderful night. You had a little bit of a catalyst to start doing this project. And that was when Willie's sister, Bobby passed away. Was that kind of the push that you needed to get this ball rolling? Willie is involved with a with a music venue called Luck, where they they do stuff out there, and Willie plays out there, and so they called me as as a well known, you know, Willie junkie and 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 huge fan, and and asked me if I might be the music director for a 90th birthday party out at Luck, and I was like, sure, that just sounds like big fun to me. And then my buddy, who's a he writes for Texas Monthly and he knows all things Texas. He said, it's not 90, it's 89. And so I went back to the luck people. I texted them and I was like, y'all know it's not his 90th birthday. 10 minutes where they were obviously kicking things around. They said, let's do it anyway. I said, I'm in, you know, I'll do it. You bet. And then they booked, they started booking all of these big names and the show was pretty much together. And then uh, Sister Bobby passed away. And, and immediately at, at that point, the, the luck people called me and said, Willie wants to play. Is that OK? <laughs> and so <laughs> and so at that point, then it was to him, you know, Willie was playing after us and it just kept getting more magical and magical as it went along. But with the, the show was already coming together before he was going to play or anything. So it just one step at a time fell into place. When you talk about the lineup of artists, entertainers that performed on this bill, I'm assuming it wasn't really difficult to round up those names to get them to be a part of it. I guess not for them and not then when Willie was involved, you know, they all played for nothing or next to nothing, you know, and got themselves to Texas. And I have no idea what Cheryl Crow or 
or Nathaniel Rayliff, you know, or these guys, you know, get paid to play, you know, but they did it just out of love for the music. And so that was the luck people and, and that it was about Willie and Margot. And, and so, yeah, everybody just said yes until we just had to stop asking people. You mentioned, of course, Cheryl Crow. You also had uh, yourself. You had Robert Earl Keane, and you, Margot Price was on the bill along with so many others. What was that like when you have that type of a lineup to figure out who goes where, when, and how, and all those logistical nightmares that would be rampant in any other environment? This is going to come out wrong, but I played so many events like this, and I, half of them, they weren't that much fun. And so I did a lot of things different on this one where it was like, you know, if I ever got to do that, this is what I do. And so I did all of those things. What were some of those things? Well, we didn't go by billing. We mixed everything up. We started with a, with a long list. We got together with the band and we came up with a list of songs that we felt, number one, that should be part of it. And that number two, we knew we could play really, really well. I put the band together to where I knew it's like, hey, you, they won't have to rehearse. We all know Willie Nelson songs. We could play any of them. And so we got together in the place. Um, I'm here now. And we, we ran over those songs and we said, yeah, we, we can play these, you know, if somebody, you know, wants to do this song. And so I started with a long list and I did start kind of at the top of the list of the biggest artists of letting them choose uh, which songs that they win and and gave and, and tried, but there were so many songs to choose from. And so I went through all of that. That took a long time to get people to sign on to these things and make sure that somebody was singing Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain and somebody was going to sing Willie, you know, Whiskey River and somebody was going to sing these other things. And, and so we did that. And then, and then we let everybody know that it wasn't going to be by billing and everybody was going to be mixed up and you were only going to do one song at a time. And we were just going to kind of come and go and it was going to be just as crazy and goofy as a Willie show was years ago. And so we got all of that stuff out of the way and everybody was just totally on board with it. Margot played the second song of the night and then she played again a half an hour later. And everybody, they, they all were just way into it. And, and I almost felt like that they thought it was cool, you know, <laughs> that they didn't that it didn't have to be, okay, it's all leading up to this. And then I'm before that person and I'm this, it was all mixed up. And it was just like, we tried to take all the, the ego out of it, but not that they would have had any, but we just tried to make it all about Willie's music. When you choose these songs and obviously the level of artists that you had performing, Jerry Jeff Walker, I guess was part of this, Charlie Crockett, David Ramirez, especially with the house band that you put together. Did you have to work out key signatures for it to fit within there? How did you determine that at, at what point? Oh, that's not that difficult. It was, it just, it, it took some time. We knew, we knew so much about, about it that, that that wasn't that tough. Once we got the artist signed on for the songs and, and, uh, and then they all just turned in their keys, you know, it was, that part was pretty easy, and we knew the songs really well. It was great. On the show with us today, business side of music, Bruce Robinson. He is the founder of The Next Waltz, which is a label, a recording studio, a musical community, and a management company. And we're going to talk a little bit about the songs that made it onto this project as soon as we get back. Hi, this is Joan L. Mosser, and you're listening to The Business Side of Music. You're listening to the business side of music. For those who love it loud, Pantheon Podcast presents Rockin' Pod Weekend. Nashville, March 17th through the 19th. It's a rock convention featuring panels, interviews, podcasts, signing sessions, vinyl, comic books, pop culture, and collectibles. Over 50 celebrity guests, including members of Mr. Big, Tough, Great White, Keel, Winger, Accept, and Twisted Sister. Live concert. 
concerts, including Rare Hair on Friday, Keel Fest 2 on Saturday, and Eric Martin's Big Acoustic on Sunday. Plus a rockin' comedy show featuring Courtney Cronin Dold, Don Jameson from That Metal Show, and Craig Gast from The Howard Stern Show, and a whole lot more. Full details at rockinpod.com. Rockin' Pod Weekend is presented by Pantheon Podcast in association with RFK Media, Third Power Amplification, and BobbyDreyer.com. Hey, this is Jack Sharkey, host of the Between the Notes podcast. Are you a music fan? Do you still get a thrill from your favorite songs? Are you curious about the history, development, and tech behind it all? Well, then join us each week as we explore that and more on the Between the Notes podcast. Check us out on Facebook at Podcast Between the Notes and find us everywhere you get your podcasts. You're listening to the business side of music. What a fine introduction. I can hardly wait to hear me. <laughs> Whiskey River, take my mind. Don't let her memory talk to me. Whiskey River, don't run dry. You're all I got, take care of me. Whiskey River. Back on the show, Bruce Robison, who is the founder of the record label, The Next Waltz. We're talking about a project that they did that's, I believe, is coming out April 28th of this year. Yeah, right around Willie's birthday. It's called One Night in Texas. It's The Next Waltz's tribute to the redheaded stranger. As we said, April 28th, 2023, which will be Willie's 90th birthday. You had this huge list. When we talk about Willie Nelson's catalog, it's rather large. How did you cull that down? And well, first of all, let me ask this. How many songs on the project? That's a good question. There's probably 14 on the record, and we probably did double that at the show. 14 on the record, double of that on the show. You obviously had to cull that list down to get the 25 or 30 for the show, and then reduce that down to the 14 that are on the album. How did you go about picking and choosing? Well, I had a few that were my favorites and really between songs that we knew we had to do. And then actually once Willie was playing, then there was some that we we weren't going to do because he was playing them. So when you put all those parameters together and we went to the artist, it kind of fell into place. I had some, yeah, when you talk to them, that was Ray's idea, Ray Wiley's idea to do Whiskey River. He used to do that. And and that was cool. And I had seen Margo. Uh, she had done uh, Sisters Coming Home somewhere. And she'd done Shotgun Willie, too. She had sung both of those. And she had, you know, does a great job of it. And, and then Steve Earle had recorded both of those songs already. So there was a lot of things that helped us along the way. But it was just really, really fun to, you know, to have. Uh, the thing is a testament to that body of work. And uh, a lot of the songs, you know, Willie, they're iconic. Some of them he didn't write. Some of them he did. Um, but, you know, it, it's one of those things that, you know, I hope it'll be a little, a small part of, you know, how the story of how amazing that this uh, 90 years of, you know, this guy's career was. This is a big, it was a very formative to me, was a big influence on me and continues to be. And so um, I just wanted to be a little part of that story. And when you think about some of the songs that these various artists did, like Robert Earl King uh, did Poncho and Lefty, Ray Wiley Hubbard's Whiskey River, I'm sure that just had to be a magical moment on stage when, when these artists are paying tribute to Willie with, with such classic songs. And really interpreting them as well. You know, uh, you can see... Those were a lot of different artists that are all over the place, you know, and stylistically. So I, I just I feel really strongly about it, that it was uh, that it that it shows a little bit about how wide his influence was, 
and how, you know, he didn't just influence the people at the bottom of the food chain. He just, it just influenced the greatest artists going back for decades and, and how much he's a part of the firmament of this music. And that, you know, that's what the next waltz is about, that the writers that, uh, that kind of started this movement, a lot of them were based in Texas, that I think uh, the writers that changed country writing to an art form, you know, when you think about some of the writers from Texas, like like Towns Van Zandt and, and Willie Nelson and Guy Clark and Chris Christopherson and Rodney Crowell, they were writers who who took, you know, country music and changed it, who made it really uh, sophisticated emotionally and, and went deep. And so uh, that's the spirit that the next waltz is is built on. You know, um, country music was different before those people. And that's the tradition that we that we try and build on. Was there a particular moment or a particular song that seemed to stand out more? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but I'm just wondering, <laughs> was was there a moment where? Where you went, this is kind of an aha moment of the evening. There was a lot, but I mean, after Sister Bobby died, before we knew Willie was going to play, but I, Emily Gimbel, who um, is Texas music royalty, she's Johnny Gimbel's uh, granddaughter, and she played piano, and and we made sure that a, that we got a grand piano to be up there and part of Willie uh, and tribute to Bobby. And we said, you know, our last rehearsal after Bobby died, we said, we got to play Down Yonder because Bobby played that in every Willie show. And so we did that and everybody knew why, where we were coming from. And it was and it was such a, an amazing moment. And another one uh, had to do with Emily as well, that we played a song that I loved that I knew it wasn't a big hit song, but it was really a big deal to me, a song called How Will I Know? And it's on the record and, and Emily played the solo on it. And on the original record, it's Johnny Gimbel, who is no longer with us, you know, and he, he played on that record of Faces and Stages and he also played with Bob Wills. And, but to have Emily play in her grandfather's solo on this song was crazy. And then there was a moment, the single that's out right now is Nathaniel Rateliff doing uh, Blue Eyes Crying in the Rain. And we do the first part of it, just kind of him with acoustic guitar. And then the band comes in halfway through. There's 5,000 people there, a sold out show. And everybody's just totally quiet. And then when the band gently starts to come in and you can hear the crowd come in and lift it up, there were just so many chill bump moments on the night where I, I couldn't believe. I mean, you know, they'd have fired me, I'm sure. I said, yeah, let me do this. And then they got all of these artists and then Willie was playing. And then, you know, they probably would have had whoever is music director on the one next month that's in the Hollywood Bowl, you know, they would have got somebody else to do it. But I was already glommed onto this thing and and got to do it in a way that that I really think is fitting because in, around where we live in, here in Texas, that you can't. You just it's you can't put your finger. You can't show what Willie Nelson means to people, to the artists and to, you know, just growing up here. You know, I didn't think I was going to be in music and growing up in Bandera, Texas and and what Willie's music was around my house and, you know, around those records. So, you know, when it, when good times and bad, it's just it's really hard to uh, to show how important that his music is to the culture. And so that's what it was all about. Well, and of course, anybody that follows music history knows that at one point, Willie Nelson came to Nashville to seek success to, you know, his, his claim to fame and obviously had some good luck, wrote some great songs, got him pitched to some wonderful artists, but eventually moved back to Texas. And I say that because the Texas music scene is so diametrically opposite of the Nashville music scene that I think it's a wonderful way to to really create something in Texas that honestly I don't believe could be pulled off in Nashville and I'm a Nashville boy well I, th I think you're right about that and Willie wrote the the path that we all showed that we all follow where 
and probably was a big reason why I felt like I could stay in, in Austin. I tried to spend a lot of time in Nashville and, uh, and, I, and I thought about moving there and I was really happy to be part of, of the songwriting community and love doing it. But at some point, I decided to attack it as an outsider and was really glad that I stayed in Texas, but I still loved my friends and it ended up getting some songs cut like Willie did. And But I don't know, that's a thing that I don't think existed before he created it and, and makes it seem like a, a relevant thing to do is to be able to stay to stay here and still feel like that you're going to uh, to affect things and be able to do great work. And now there are other people, you know, who do that and uh, who stay here and make great music. And he created that template. On the show with us today here on the business side of music, Bruce Robinson. Hey, this is Dave Craver, president of the Amp Kids Foundation, and you're listening to the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. As a musician, you have a dream, that vision of what success looks like for you. Though it's not only about the money, money is part of it. Whether you've been extremely successful or you're just striving to maintain a regular cash flow, you need a plan. Money Concepts can help you develop a customized plan to achieve the financial stability and success you want. For over 40 years, Money Concepts has been providing holistic financial planning services to individuals, families, and business owners. As an independent firm, Money Concepts and their associates are committed to always represent the best interest of the client. It's really about a committed, benevolent interest in them personally. This independence coupled with that committed, benevolent interest means they represent you, the client, not a product supplier. It's not about selling products. It's about helping you achieve success. To learn how this can benefit you, contact my buddy, John Adams, with Money Concepts at 737 877- 867-9309. That's 737-867-9309. You can also email John at jadams at moneyconcepts.com. Whether you consider yourself a musician or not, music is all around us and it affects our everyday lives. Whether it's background music influencing our shopping habits in a store, organ music adding the vibe to a baseball game, or a playlist convincing us to keep going on that last mile of a run. I'm Mindy Peterson, host of the podcast Enhanced Life with Music, where we take a holistic look at music's benefits through the lens of science and medicine, entertainment, and business. You can find me and Enhanced Life with Music at mpetersonmusic.com slash podcast or wherever you get your audio. You're listening to the business side of music. Towards the runway With a smoke and haze Reminding me How I feel As a country boy Who's learning That the pitfalls Of the city Are extremely real Well all the nightlife And the parties Temptation and deceit The order of the day It's a bloody merry morning Cause I'm leaving Baby somewhere In L.A. Back on the show, Bruce Robinson, all the way from Texas, who is the founder, the creator of The Next Waltz, which is a really cool name for a record label. And I, I want to talk about your record label for a few minutes, if you don't mind. Established in 2016 in Austin, Texas, where you're at, you really have created a, a home for a lot of artists who may otherwise not have been getting the exposure that they deserve, right? We leveraged both things. We've put some music out with some people that are blowing doors already, you know, we, and that has been a big deal for us whenever it's like, it, it operates kind of like a cooperative where people, they pretty much get what they put in. And so when the, the Turnpike Troubadours or Shaky Graves or you know, where Rodney Crowell or Jerry Jeff Walker, God rest his soul, you know, the Robert Keene, a lot of people who have 
come and done music with us. They they had lots of other options, um, but the big artists that we work with are, uh, you know, they add more eyeballs onto the newer artists that we're that are starting. We've done it, and we try. That's a big part of our mission is to do music on artists that need to be discovered. And in the climate that we're at right now, it's really hard to invest because it's still really expensive to to put music out the way that we do it. And to invest in the newer artists that don't have a big following yet is really difficult to do, but it's important that we feel like it's important for us to do that. How are you finding these new artists that are coming to you? What makes that decision for you to sign them? Well, we don't sign anybody. I mean, okay. we've developed a different thing, and that's and that it really is a different kind of an approach that I developed a lot uh, over the years. It was really when I started and decided I was going to try and figure out what a singles record label would look like. That was from ground zero. We just didn't know how that would work. And then we created this digital platform called The Next Waltz because we, we figured out we had to have content that would go along and, and, and tell the story of what we were doing. And so we started making the content along with the singles to be able to use this, uh, this cool content to promote the stuff. And then kind of after that, then it morphed back into a label as well. And then, and then over time, we were building up this uh, catalog of singles. And now we've, we have a few full-length records as well. So it's been a new approach. And then over, it took a long time. It was a really hard slog. It sucks. You know, the first few years when we, you know, it's so much streaming now and when we didn't have any streams and, and now we, you know, we get a, we get close to 3 million a month um, on the strength of the singles that we put out and, and that people have come to us with and, and built up our, our, um, the, the vinyl that we sell. And, and so it's been a, you know, we, we just made it up little by little, but as far as finding the art, artists, Man, there's a lot of really great artists down here. There's so many. It's more just trying to come up with the resources to to be able to put the stuff out in the right way because it's a, it's still a really big investment. We're real lean mean when we do a when we do a single, a digital single, it's somewhere between 2 and 5 grand. It's we can do it really, you know, really uh, effectively there. Um, you know, but putting out a full-length record, it's just really hard to do. You got to pay, you know, when you, if you pay the players, and you you put any promotion into it at all, you know, then you're up, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars real quick. So it's more just you know trying to scrape enough pennies together to do the work that we want to do. People that are interested in the Texas music scene, and there are a lot of them out there, and they're not just all in Texas. Yeah. How can they go about finding your label and the roster and getting some of that great music? Well, the next we have all the people that we've done, uh, done our sessions with. There's a lot of great stuff on there over the years, the next and that, and that, that has, that has all of our music. There's a lot of good places to find uh, music these days, but that's the place to find ours. And we start with the song. We try it, have it be a great song that shows a little more about these artists and maybe shows a side of them that is not readily available, but also fitting completely. And so we, there are so many songs out there that, you know, then that's what changed my life as an ugly songwriter when, when people did my songs and took them to a wider audience. And so that's still what we're trying to do. I mean, the, the label system and the publishing system is collapsed and, and there's hardly anything left of it from, you know, from what there was when I was working as a songwriter in Nashville. But there's still tons of songs out there and great songwriters. And so we just got to be creative enough to where people will find it. And then in the meantime, I want to remind everybody again, this album that's coming out. April 28th, 2023, one day before Willie Nelson turns 90. It's called One Night in Texas, the next Waltz's tribute to the redheaded stranger. And of course, that's your record label. And people can go online and order. Now, is there going to be a pre order or are you going to wait until it's. It already started. Already started. Pre order right now. Yeah. So if you want a copy of the project, and once again, 14 songs. I don't know how you narrowed it down to that, because when I look at the playlist, I'm man, there's just some great songs. But definitely you want to check this out. 
man, just the best of luck for what you're doing. And, and I hope this album gets all the success that it deserves. Well, I'll tell you what, thank you for having a little time for us, Bob. It's been great fun. And, and I think that people are going to like this. And we, you know, we, it's an embarrassment of riches of the music down here. And, and, and it's really fun to be part of it. And thank you for shining a little light on that. I really appreciate it. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Busan.